Hi. How's everyone? Good? Good day so far? My name is Danny Deal, and I am here with the wonderful Fote, Evan Shorenstein, Hello. a turntablist, producer, drummer extraordinaire who was born in Woodstock, uh, lived in Africa for a brief moment, now resides in Brooklyn, and we're going to do a track deconstruction with him. So there's a particular song that we've picked out, which I think will be really interesting to start from the ground level and work up. So where would you like to begin with this? What is the song called, by the way? Um, is this song? Cool. Uh, so the song is called Pressure, and um, it's a work in progress. It's part of like an album that I'm currently working on, so I thought it would be fun to kind of open it up. Uh, so there's that as a disclaimer. And um, it has an interesting origin, and uh, I've been thinking a lot about origins lately because I hit a lot of creative blocks, and it's helpful for me to go back and see kind of the non-traditional ways that have inspired me. Because I don't usually sit down at a piano and write a tune. It's more some weird convoluted process of like hearing a sound that was recorded in a specific place and just that whole ambience sparking a whole tune. You have a long history with found sound though and wanting to dig in the outside world for inspiration, yes? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and I think it comes from growing up and having sort of a fear of sound or like being kind of sensitive and to, uh, you know, I don't know, thunder. I mean, that, maybe that's a, an easy one, but that was like pretty terrifying to me as a kid, but also really interesting. And I was like fascinated, but also terrified. Um, Didn't and, your parents also get you some CDs? with some sounds on them, like trains, things like that? Yeah, my, my mother got me this train CD. I was really young. It was just like hours and hours of trains, like the train horn and then literally just like the rumbling and the rattling of a train. Uh, and we would listen to it in the car, just driving around. <laughs> and and uh, but, but yeah, I don't know, something that was probably like the first instance that was kind of leading to doing this now, of sort of that like really just being like stimulated by natural sound and um, just kind of where your imagination goes, especially when you're listening to sound after the fact. Like it's amazing when you record out in the street or something and then you're back in your apartment in your house and you're all cozy and you're listening back and you just, in retrospect, you just hear things in a different, almost more presently sometimes. So what was the, the time difference between when you recorded the sound that became the base for this and then when you actually started working on the song? Was there a separation, a time separation between that? Um, so for this particular song, yeah, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll give some backstory. Um, I, back in the spring, um, I was kind of in a bit of like a drier period with writing um, and I was, I don't know, I guess I was trying to focus on some new synth synthesizers I was working with and I was feeling really sterile and kind of like working in my kind of bedroom studio, apartment studio and like just feeling like, oh, this feels stagnant. It doesn't feel like it's not taking my imagination anywhere. I can see the synth, I can hear it, and I can just picture the synth and that's it. Uh, at least that's where my head was at. And, there are these bunkers in New York, uh, this area called Fort Tilden, and it's like right on, it's near Coney Island, and it's an old military base. There's a lot of bunkers, and they're right on the beach. Um, and I heard about it for a while, and I thought, wouldn't it be like interesting to go record there? Because I've been fascinated with convolution reverb for a while, uh, which for anyone who's not interested, it's, it's reverb that takes the exact dimensions and impulse of an actual clap or tone in a space. But I was like, oh, it's time to go to real spaces and kind of, I don't know, that just seems inspiring. So I called up a couple of friends one day, um, a guitarist friend, uh, another producer, and a friend who was visiting who was actually a trained classical vocalist, but uh, operatic but most of us didn't, don't sing. So anyways, we all went out 
and the intention was to kind of record vocal harmonies in this bunker for the day. And we got out there and it was a bright sunny day, it was beautiful. We went inside the bunker and it's cold, well, yeah, cold and, and dark and pretty terrifying. Uh, and we started to record, I, I just kind of set up a field recorder and we started to kind of sing these tones, just like all singing the same note and then kind of gliding away and then having one person sing, sing a note and then everyone else just sings random harmony and you kind of end up in some weird chord that you would never intend. Um, and there was even a room where we saw some like flickering and we were, uh, sent one of our friends over and there were candles and there was this weird kind of vigil set up. And we went in and it was, it was just more of a peaceful thing, kind of honoring someone. But all in all, it was really spooky and it led to these like really interesting harmonies and, and just kind of being spooked in the moment kind of evoked something cool. Um, and there's hours of it, but within that I found this loop of this kind of like, it almost feels kind of like this Baroque chord progression loop. And, uh, and I came back and, and made it this, this track we're focusing on today, kind of almost everything in one day, which is rare for me. It usually takes coming back and back. Um, but in the best moments, it's like fleshed out most of the song in one day. And that only happened because of the kind of life in this recording and the density. Um, and at least for me, I realize that's a big part of my process is, uh, I don't know, it's not always just like sitting down at a piano, it's like going to this weird place and having that experience and then I come home and then everything just flows and um, yeah. The experience becomes part of the song. Yeah. Definitely, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think we could listen to it in full before we start with the foundation of it? Certainly, yeah. yeah. See what the finished product is like?
Thanks. I'm just curious, did that sound okay? It was a little bit like crazy delay up here, but I assume you're okay, cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's just like about midway through where I cut it off. Um, so let's hear what those vocals sounded like when you started with it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I guess just to go back to some of the recordings, so just to trace it back. So these were the original, I've just kind of selected like about a minute out of these like maybe four hours of recording of uh, kind of like the vibe that we were. So there were kind of these chords, and then sort of the basis for this tune was this loop. Um, And for this tune, I just kind of went in and uh, did a little bit of pitching. And it's definitely not perfectly in key. Um, which I don't know, is a little frustrating, but I also really gravitate towards those kind of things. Um, and yeah, so once I kind of found that, I don't know I just got really in the zone and kind of just fleshed out the tune from there. Um, and I guess the, like, the first thing I jumped into were the drums, just to bring it back a bit. Do you have any additional processing on these vocals, or? Um, not really. Uh, like a bit of EQing, just to kind of brighten it up a bit. Um, and a little bit of extra reverb, actually, because when recording in this space, there's like this beautiful natural trail, but I was doing, at moments, like cutting some vocals, and so adding a little bit of reverb on top of that just to kind of ease the, the cutoffs. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it looks like you layered them quite a bit, which is also one of your hallmarks in general with production, is stacking things on top of each other. Yeah, yeah, for better or for worse, I get really into, like, it's funny, I listen to a lot of music that's like single instrument, like solo instrumental music, because maybe that's the, the extreme of what I don't do so often. Um, so I don't know, something for me is like layering sounds and having the um, kind of the ambiguity of like, it's kind of hard to pick out the original source or it doesn't sound like the DAW or the program because there's just so much kind of stimulation that's sort of like covering the original source. And um, yeah, so with this vocal, I mean, I. I went through and I added my own vocals and there's quite a few layers there, but it's mostly just this, just this loop. It's kind of standing on its own. And then from here you said you tackled drums once you had this idea with the vocals? Yeah. Um, yeah, and drums have become harder and harder for me because I'm a drummer and I don't know if that's why, but I, 
I don't know, I guess in terms of like a kick on the one and a snare on the two, certain things like that. I mean, I love a lot of dance music and kind of four on the floor style club music, but I don't know, for me, like using toms more and kind of things that are not as like traditional, um, I've, I've just been more satisfying. Um, so these drums are sort of this loop here. Um, and these samples are just from the, the machine, like the machine controller, their library, which a friend gave me like maybe five years ago, and I use it a lot. Um, and I don't know, I guess I find it's fun to have something that's like super organic and was recorded elsewhere. And then when you're in a zone and you have like, you know, a drop down menu on the left and you have these sample packs, it's, for me it helps. It's instead of sampling records, it's kind of like this, just these sounds that are there and you can throw them right in. It just kind of keeps the momentum going. Um, I don't really like to produce solely using those, but when there's the extreme of like, oh, here are these vocals that we recorded in a, in a bunker, then I like the idea of like, here's a stock kick drum or 808, mm -hmm. as stock as it gets. And I don't know, I guess I like the balance of the two. You always like the balance of the two though. You always like having something that is organic or something that people can relate to, and then something that is completely wild and alien to con contrast that. Your music seems to live in that little Venn diagram. Yeah, I guess when it becomes too serious, it gets to me. <laughs> like, this was all pristinely recorded using the best preamps and, and this and that. Um, I don't know, I start to have weird thoughts of like, well, is that really necessary? And like, is it just me that knows that? Um, and then when it's really kind of more DIY or in the box, I guess, and it's kind of just dragging samples and just using the mouse, uh, then that becomes its own thing that I don't really want to solely be involved in. So yeah, the two extremes helps. Being a drummer, is it, do you find do you, that you miss the physicality when you're programming drums? Is that something that bugs you or you've tried to resolve in some way? Yeah, definitely. And I, yeah, a lot of the time in Ableton, as much as I, I'd like to paint a more like romantic picture of recording process, it's a lot of chopping, you know, just in general, a lot of tedious editing. Um, sometimes it's, it's, a lot of the time I'll, I'll kind of do that tedious editing and then I'll play like a tambourine or something over it with one take and not edit that. So once again, I guess there's some extremes there. Of, um, but a lot of the time, yeah, there's like a drum loop or something that I recorded and then I edit it a lot. Um, but I do miss that and I do, I try to, I'm trying to get to that place where things are really physical. Um, but then sometimes when you have really quantized things and things that are really free, there are times when it works, but there are other times where I, where it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I do want to say that throughout this, we're not actually going to have a Q and A at the end. We're going to have little moments throughout. So if there are any questions in the audience right now, as we're going along, there are, I think two people one person upstairs, two people on this floor. So if you do have a question, I see one question up here in front. Thank you. Uh, first of all, really awesome composition, really great product. Um, curious about templates. Did you start, do you have like, do you start with a template, uh, like an Ableton session with a bunch of either pre-selected categories maybe with or without VSTs, maybe with or without presets even? Or do you start from scratch or does it depend on the year? Good question. Um, I think templates are really useful, but for whatever reason I don't, I've never spent a day creating like a beautiful template. <laughs> I have a friend who's done it. He has like 40 kicks at his disposal at all times that he trusts and he's heard them in clubs. He knows exactly how they sound. But for me it's usually like, stopping in the middle and trying to find a kick. And, and it's not always the best thing, but um, what I found is actually I end up going, and I was gonna dive into this later in the song, is I, I end up going into older 
session files and kind of sampling myself or sampling songs that never went anywhere. Um, uh, so I guess kind of diving into worlds that I set up already and kind of extracting one thing from them is maybe where like the template lies, where it's sort of just like using this like vast library. I mean, it's, it's yeah, you can always sample yourself. <laughs> and I think that's, I've been doing that a lot. Um, I guess, well, I'll dive in really quick to the, to the strings here. Um, so there's this chorus piece. Um, So just uh, to solo the strings and my vocals. So um, that string line is from a song that never came out. Maybe it will one day, but um, I'll just play a bit of that song. It's, it's a song, I guess I even have it labeled here, 2016 is when I last exported it and, it, and nothing ever happened. Um, but I don't know, I don't know what led me to do it, but I was working on this tune and I just kind of jumped in and took the strings. Um, here's this original track that was called Petrichor. I've uh, never played it for anyone, but <laughs> here you go. So just hear the isolated strings. Um, so I just kind of went through and, and chopped those up. And but th this was from a song from two years ago. How did it occur to you to go back to that project? It was, did it immediately pop in your head? that song or were you just digging through old things and stumbled upon it? Um, I think I was thinking about strings because um, with that kind of extreme before of like having things that are really in the box and like derived from like a sample pack, just like dragging something in. I really like the surprise of having like brass or strings, like something that feels like a higher production value or something. I, it just, and I like that surprise of all of a sudden like, oh, there are strings in this tune. It's like that now, okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and I guess just on the fly, it's, it's I mean, you know, maybe I'll re-record them, but um, there's also an interesting quality to them, just like sampling. It's like when I recorded them, I don't think I recorded them properly and I, the mic wasn't very good, but that 
like if I play them on their own, uh, I wouldn't say they. So I just kind of cut them up like I would with a sample. Um, and there's some like, kind of weird warping artifacts and stuff, but uh, I don't know, I just became accustomed to that and liked it. So um, I think similar to sampling, it's like that joy of taking something that has its own characteristics. And I don't know, when you go and re-record it sometimes and it's perfect and it's, you could go and use a better mic, but often the case is like, oh, I prefer the, Shitty strings. <laughs> Not that these are shitty, but. Does anyone else have a question? I'd see you there. Hey, what's up, man? Fan of, fan of your music. Thanks for doing this. It's always cool to see how other people work. Um, couple questions, I guess. First one being, your drums always sound like really nicely forward in the mix yet not in an obtrusive way. Do you break out your drum racks into like separate kicks, separate snares, hats and so forth on individual tracks and process them? Second question, I'm guessing this probably isn't the mixing session for this song, but I noticed there's only three sends going and I'm wondering like how much, how deeply you use your sends when you mix. Cause for instance, I run out of sends, you know? <laughs> I'm always like figuring out ways to put like a few things on a send and automate them going on and off when I need them to, to go on and off. So just wondering how you, how you do it. Cool, um, thanks Ben. Uh, yeah, well I guess with the drums, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean with, for me as a drummer and also like, I don't know, drums just feel like priority a lot of the time uh, and Actually, like, dub music is like a huge influence in kind of how powerful the drums are, the drums and the bass, the rhythm section. Um, so it's always a priority, but I, I, I used to do more, I mean, even in this tune, it's like individual, kind of it's like a drum rack with the individual uh, stems, but more and more now I've been using drum machines and kind of just recording a loop and then it is what it is mix it down on the drum machine and then like record it in and that's that. I think mentally it's just kind of where I'm at more and more. But, but for this one, I mean, just to show. Um, so this is like a couple of samples. And um, I had just to effects on the master of the drum rack. So it's this primal tap. Uh, turn that off. And then a radiator, kind of amp, distortion, kind of warmth. Um, and I was taking those off the other day, I realized like, right, I realized they were adding a lot. Um, And with a lot of things, uh, and I got into these weird kind of head games where I was like, oh, well, the source should sound really good. The source, source is important. But then it's also really fun to just like have an effects chain that is, everything is wet from the get-go and you're just playing from that sound from, from, from the origin. Um, so yeah, I think I just threw these on the drum rack and it, was, it is what it is. Um, and yeah, I mean, with a lot of drum stuff, I just do it by ear. Um, I had some education in school with mixing, but it's mostly by ear um, and a lot of kind of more technicalities often as much as maybe I should be paying attention to the specific frequencies. A lot of it's just by ear. So, um, More than a lot of people, because I've, I've seen multiple project files from you at this point, and you don't seem to have a consistent working process in how you group tracks or how you treat drums. I've seen projects where you draw out the individual drum hit 200 times <laughs> on one, one uh, channel. And then here you're using drum rack. And then there was a, another project where you recorded out of the bukla and used those sounds as drums. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're pretty versatile. 
and, and how you work. Yeah, I like the, like the elusiveness of a sound. Like some of my favorite artists are all over the place. And I, I have a lot of respect for like, that's a sound. Like recently I was listening to, I was kind of going back and listening to some early burial records. I was like, wow, there's such a sound. It's such a specific world. Um, and I guess like everyone has a sound to a certain extent, but it's really fun to just break that expectation and kind of um, make your sound more elusive, um, which I guess can get you into trouble with, just before we, were, we had a panel discussion in here, we were talking about missed bookings and how I've gotten booked for some gigs that are like, wow, I should have been just DJing. There's just no time to be playing ambient pads and sound like, <laughs> um, but all in all, I think it, the versatility is really fun and it, it makes for a lot of different scenarios, show-wise. And, um, and your second question was about the... the yeah, right. Um, yeah, that's another thing. Some, some sessions I use a lot more sends, uh, but I guess not a ton. Sometimes I just kind of have reverb just on the track uh, and it is what it is. Um, or I do a lot of kind of like, I'll make a send. I'll kind of record like a, a swell with a fader automation and I'll kind of flatten that audio source and I'll delete the send. So just kind of like flatten it to the audio file and move on. I use a Profit um, 6 a lot um, over the last year. And it's funny because when I, when I bought it, I thought like, oh, this is great. Now I have that synth that I've been trying to replicate for years and here it is and it sounds great. It sounds better than analog within Ableton, I guess, right? But also it was kind of like, okay, now I have the real thing and it, yeah, it's, it's really powerful. But um, I don't know, in a way all of a sudden I started thinking like, I don't want to just make like, like the arpeggiators are amazing. Everything sounds great, but I was like, I don't want to just make kind of more synth based music. Like I really, Maybe this was not what I wanted. Like I wanted kind of <laughs> more natural sound. And, um, but I found that there's a lot of patches that I use that kind of, I don't know, to me they don't really sound like a synthesizer. Like when you're using like a white noise oscillator or something, a lot of that sounds like kind of like, you know, it's more of like a breathy quality or something. And I gravitate towards those, those parts of, of synths. Um, and uh, here's a patch in here that was, I just labeled it wind, but it, um, it's the solo. Those are just two, if I were to break it down, there's one pan to the left. And then I believe, yeah, the, the same patch in the right is just pitched up a fifth. Yeah, and to me it just, it was kind of more of an exotic patch and I like a lot of instruments from around the world that are kind of, uh, at least to like maybe like Western tuning sound out of, out of tune, um, or just kind of slide more and more like kind of microtonal areas. And this patch was, uh, you know, had like a white noise oscillator and, and then I think there was like an LFO kind of square wave that was like jumping between fifths or maybe an octave. So it was like, just the notes were jumping around a lot. There was a lot of unexpected tonality, which I don't know, for me, like a lot of, I'm pretty intentional with the mixes and like what happens, like when I'm, I'll do some soloing, but it's mostly like this happens here and this happens here. 
and I fully intend for that to happen. But with the actual recording and the, the songwriting, it's more all about mistakes and kind of, you know, coming from a background of more like sampling records and whatnot, it's like you, you take something that already exists, but you work with like the surprises within it. Um, or it's, it's just not something you created. Like when you're sampling, it's, it's a source that already exists and there's that, that fun moment of then taking your layer, chopping it up or whatever you might do. Um, so I guess I try to apply that to like even like patches where they, they jump around a lot and yeah. Does anyone else have a, oh, we've got a few. Um, here in the front. Uh, a microphone's coming to you. I was curious if you could, oh. I was curious if you could t uh, talk a little bit about your process around where you start to think about, like, okay, now I'm going to sit down and start to mix, and then, you know, now I'm going to, when I'm going to start to think about mastering, and maybe if we could even see what's on your, your master uh, channel. Uh, I've been switching it up uh, lately, so I've been working kind of more in like a proper studio a couple times a week, as well as home. And uh, I kind of take more of those moments to be like, okay, I'm gonna track piano on this tune and being a little more like specific about what I'm recording and, and uh, um, but then spending a lot of time with that, manipulating it. Um, with the mixing and mastering, I, I have a couple friends who are amazing mixers, uh, mixing engineers, and I learn a lot from them. And I, I don't know, at this point, I, I don't really consider myself to be, like, like my first EP that uh, came out, uh, a lot of it was clipping. <laughs> and like, uh, it was loud, but there was a lot of stuff that like after the fact I learned, I was doing it wrong. Um, and there was a kind of a phase of, even with mastering, there was an engineer um, who kind of, I was learning a lot from them. Uh, I don't know, and part of that process almost I feel like stunted a couple things. Like it was great to be more knowledgeable um, and learn about like preserving your signal. But at the same time, like I, I don't really like being too precious in the moment. Like when I think too much about like head, headroom and, and like being like really safe, I get too much, I get into a safe zone. Um, and there's like an edge that's missing. Um, and so I love, I love those times where you hear about like a mix or like a tune that you've loved and you realize they were just like doing the inverse of what you expected or they were violating a, a, a rule. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, in terms of like mixing and stuff like that, it's, it's a lot, I try to go by ear mostly and then integrate those things that I'm learning along the way. And with mastering, um, yeah, I, I, I've always like kind of had mastering after the fact. I don't, it's a kind of an art form that uh, is kind of mysterious to me. Um, and sometimes I do it, like when I DJ, so occasionally I'll try to like kind of do a quick master and throw it up. But um, yeah, it's usually, I think it's nice to hand that off to someone else after the fact, uh, for me personally. Uh, we can take one more here in the front. So we were kind of talking about earlier how you um, you usually don't work around with like templates and stuff and how you first you had pulled out that vocal sample that you got when you were recording in the bunker and then later you went back and you got the uh, the string sample and put your own vocals on it. So when you're arranging a track per se, do you do you prefer to like have, for example, you know like this is how long this section is going to be, then I'm going to move it over to this section, and then I'm going to do this section or whatever, or do you like to just kind of wing it as you go, I guess, kind of like this is this part, and then, oh, maybe I could bring in some other instruments or like, how do you go about that, I guess? Usually it kind of make more like repetitive track in the beginning where things are a lot longer. I mean, they could just be like the extended mix, I guess. <laughs> um, and then over time, just kind of like trimming that down more. Um, 
I mean, I also love a lot of like kind of more extended style mixes. So, um, but I, a lot of the time, yeah, kind of trim them down. Um, and then I don't know. I, I this is something about my process that I don't really admire. Uh, where I'll have like an initial idea, and I'll kind of like do a, a work a lot in one day and get the foundation down. But then there's like one section in the middle that's just like either blank, a break, or like I know. I'm just like, wait, I just know there's something that's like, I guess eventually it's gonna, you know, there will be that day where it, it clicks in, but I'll, I'll struggle a lot where I'll like return and return to this session. And um, I guess I've kind of had this faith where like, not that I like put it away completely, I, I return to it a lot, but I don't know, sometimes you go play a show and you're hit with this new adrenaline and like you wake up the next morning and you just sit down and you make the new section and that just keeps happening to me, I guess. Uh, and it's not the quickest way to work, but um, yeah, it's like the bulk is made and then these little parts take time. Um, and it's funny, because I, I used to, I grew up playing in bands where we would just write the song in one session and move on. And this project doesn't seem to follow that rule so much. Um, You've mentioned to me it often takes you months to create a single song. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, yeah, months of kind of coming back, like the initial idea is maybe in a day, but then, I don't know, I like kind of integrating, I don't know, with an album, I think it's, it's nice to take time where certain external sources in your life affect the album you're working on. I think it's like, even like going out and touring a bit and coming back and realizing like, Gosh, I don't know if I want to make like straight up club music. That's like that's a that's been taking a toll on my ears and my spirit and, and and other times where I realize like I've had a lot of time alone and a lot of time at peace and I'm like, I wanna make something really aggressive. And just I don't know, I I just like those kind of valleys uh, in your life that if, that for me affect the music a lot. I like kind of the journey of maybe a year in your life. So you had mentioned to me before that after you were finished with this synth portion, you added what you called ornamentation, but I didn't know what you meant by that. Sure. On the track. So let's talk about some of the, the extra bits that you added to make it sparkle and come to life. Yeah, um, I guess the ornamentation is like my favorite part. Uh, I had a professor in school who um, was really adamant about me, like not focusing on timbre. He was like, "You need to write me a song on piano by next week. I don't want you using anything else." At the time, I was like, "What?" Uh, and I mean, I liked the challenge, but like it, and I definitely integrated melody as being like, "Well, once you have melody or a certain rhythm, you can like." I've done some shows where I had like brass come in, or I did it with a live band, and hearing that ar arrangement. It's amazing, like the melody just traveling across instruments. But at the same time, like the specific timbres are a huge part of this music. And even just like the insignificant moments, maybe, or the smaller moments of like these little clicks, like IDM music, a lot of like, um, you know, focus on these like hyper seconds. And um, so, the, so I, I don't know, I, I at least that inspires me. Um, whether people hear it or not, at least gets me like, um, gets me hyped. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I guess at the end, so there's like, um, so there's a loop towards the end. Uh, I've been working with a Bukla music easel. Um, and so like kind of inserting that slowly. Um, in this piece, it's more subtle, but it's like this, uh, but just sort of sitting over the drums. Uh, and there's a little laser sound from the prophet.
Um, and it's amazing how like with little, I don't know, little sounds in like the higher frequency range, I don't know, even if you're using kind of like a kick or something that's really dull or just like recorded terribly or something, adding those like little like sparkles, it's like, whoa, this is 3D. <laughs> Can um, we hear that section in totality? Yeah. So it's just that the last portion of the song. And uh, I'm a big fan also of kind of like throughly composed music where nothing repeats itself. I mean, obviously in this tune, there's a chorus comes back around. But I think, of it, I think in terms of like sounds, it's always really fun to have an element that only appears once in the beginning or once at the end. And I guess it's more subtle in this piece, but um, I've had a couple tunes where there's like a a trumpet or like a saxophone uh, that appears just like at the end or or maybe even more with like just like a chorus where it's like there's only really like a chorus at the very end of the song or only vocals at the end and I don't know for some people that seems like frustrating and they're like oh this really has pop potential but the chorus is at the end and you're just like noodling on a synth in the, in the middle <laughs> that's a little like harsh but uh, and I'm like yeah I guess that's true but um, I don't know I really like uh, Someone I really admire is uh, Caribou, uh, and often he'll, his vocals will come in at like the four minute mark or something, and um, I don't know, just when you give everything right away, I just, I don't know, I like when it appears later in the song, or it never appears again, yes. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, here in the middle. So this song has a lot of shuffle in it, and I'm really curious how you approach groove in your, in your music. Are you using grooves? Are you like hand manipulating things? How do you approach quantization and sort of when you're doing MIDI input? I see you also baked groove into that profit audio. So you kind of like lock that in so you can't change it later. So I'm just curious how you approach the kind of feel and groove and human feel to it. Uh, in terms of quantizing, um, I don't know, sometimes I just quantize everything flat just really, you know, 100%. Uh, but I guess like with swing and shuffle and stuff like that, um, um, I don't know, for the longest time, I'd like never, I never really like thought about it or, um, and for, as a drummer, like that stuff comes really naturally, but like I just wasn't thinking about it at all. Um, so maybe it's just more of like a, I don't know, like I occasionally there's some templates for like shuffle, which are useful, like, you know, like going in using like an NPC style swing. Um, but I don't know, a lot of the time it's not like a template and it's just kind of, it's usually like MIDI that's like really locked in and then like a, a real like djembe or some type of drum that you're playing over and those like subtleties create shuffle because you're not locked in like the MIDI is. Um, yeah, but I struggle with the grid a lot. I don't know, I'm definitely a victim of the grid. <laughs> like, uh, it definitely affects how I make music. So sometimes I, I try to do the extreme of, I've been recording drums more, like drum set on stuff recently, and that's gotten, gotten me a little out of that. Cool, any other? I'm wondering if I'm missing anyone in the back. It's harder to see. No? Okay, here in the front. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I can't be the only one in the room that suffers from this affliction. I have um, more VSTs and presets than I'll ever sample in my life. Um, and I struggle with having a creative idea in my head, but I can't really get to it until I find the, the exact sound or something really close to it. Um, and so I've heard, you know, the suggestion, you know, just write it in piano so you can get your ideas down and later on go back and slap instrument sounds on. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm just curious uh, what your experience is like when you are creating your sound you're looking for for a specific part. Um, the amount of time you go through and search things and you start losing your workflow and the ideas escape you. So how do you find that balance? Mm. Uh, so just to clarify at the end, you're talking about like when those ideas escape you because you've been like too focused on the V. You're there to create and you, you have the idea, but it's, it's better for you in that moment if you can get to that sound right away so you can really flesh out the idea. Um, and then the struggle when you realize you're spending too much time trying to find it, you know, do you have those experiences? And if you do, how do you work through them to preserve the, the creative process? Yeah, I, um, I definitely struggle with that too. Um, I've, uh, a lot of the time, a cert, I've, I've found that like certain, there's a lot of experimentation where I, I don't know, it's not so intentional in the beginning and it leads to a, pl a place like, because um, sometimes like my uh, kind of, my instinct is not really like, an instinct of how to get to a certain sound is not really working. But when I'm just like freestyling and just like like having kind of like a jam on a synth or something, I, I end up with a sound that like, oh man, it's, you know. <laughs> um, so it's a mixture. And I think like with certain VSTs, I've definitely gone down a rabbit hole. There's a good friend of mine who's always like, did you see this just came out? And I'm like, yeah, that's a nice spring reverb. I guess I should buy that. <laughs> and that's not always a good thing. I, I, I don't know, like um, the Ableton EQ actually. It's funny, I started using like a Fab Filter Pro Q number two, and it's like great and it's big. But I've been using the Ableton EQ a lot more because I realized like, I don't know, I, that, that was more natural to me. I had a better workflow with it. Um, so I think also at the, at the attempt of like using, I don't know, certain things like maybe Maybe that can eventually become your comfort zone, but like if it's like, if it's an idea that like ideas escape me pretty quickly, they don't always linger. And so I feel like you, you open up a project file and you're like, oh man, that was like, what was I doing here? But you got the, you know, the ideas down and you achieved it. So um, just, yeah, I guess judging it in the moment and like kind of which VST should I use? It's kind of like, you know, whichever one is like, clockwork for you, I guess. And then having those days where I guess not writing music as a lot, but just kind of getting comfortable with new, new VSTs. Is there a library of like go-to default sounds that at least kind of gets you moving that later on you'll go back and refine and find something better because you know you want something different? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I have a lot of like uh, homemade sounds that are kind of like my own sample library that I jump into, especially with stuff like shakers and stuff that just like really help just like throwing that right in and it just gets you off the floor. Well, we have to wrap things up. We're right at the end of the session. That hour went by so fast, but thank you again, Bote, for breaking down pressure for us. Thanks. That was amazing.